Hello and most welcome to 2075 of the lecture series. We will today continue and finish off the little that is left on Michael Esfield's Quantum Entanglement and a Metaphysics of Relations. Quantum Entanglement! <laughs> Quantum Entanglement and the Metaphysics of Relations. <laughs> Last time, we took a look at how quantum entanglement and metaphysics of the relations affect the excluded middle, the Aristotelian dogma, if you like, or I would say it's even more than a dogma since it's pre-verbal, it's pre-language. It is how we conceive the world. It's either or. Nothing can be two. And that conception has become even sterner and more fixed since the advent of Newtonian, Cartesian, geometrical thinking, where the exclusion becomes stronger. It was sometimes referred to as a sort of dualism. And mind you, it does not necessarily have to be between matter and mind. Matter and mind. Matter and mind. And mind. <laughs> it could also most definitely be in between empty space and existence or a stain. The atom and its outsideness. The void. Exactly, the void, the nothing, and the apeiron. Exogenous, endogenous, all these excluded middle thingies became stronger in the 18th century because of the massive cultural influx of Newtonian geometry, Newtonian mechanics. The idea that a human being was nothing more and nothing mere than a clock. <laughs> Can you imagine? A clock. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Later in the 18th century, 19th century, one saw human beings as steam engines. And later in the 19th century, we turn into gas engines. Today, human beings are computers. So, <laughs> It's not very hard to see from where are the metaphors or tropes coming. They are coming from the massive industrialization There's no wonder why the influence of the mechanistic worldview has been so great. The reason is, of course, it did change our lifestyle completely.
if you were to compare the real value you had before industrialization and the real value you had after for one working hour, one working hour, or well, it could be a working year, <laughs> it doesn't matter. It's actually, in the comparison, 1 to 17. So we had enormous benefits of industrialization and Newtonian mechanics by that. So much that it came to be the only measure for something being correct. Evicting all others that were before. We even came to define thinking itself, the most fundamental, I would say. So thinking became something else, like a line or words or something linear of <laughs> whatever that is. And I will continue on your reading from the net, it would be 615. Did you print out a PDF as I did? It would be page 13. And it's at the very bottom of page 13, the last paragraph. And I will then continue to read from the book, The Matter with Things by Ian McKilchrist, chapter two, chapter two. <laughs> And I make a comparison in between the two texts. To put you into the connection, Michael Asfeld has quite in depth went into what are the idea, the modern idea that replace that is to replace the classical model that all our relations even absolutely individual properties are actually stemming from relations ulterior ulteriorly they are stemming from the whole take of the whole universe might sound weird but all relations in the totality of the universe is what gives rise to every aspect, color, shape, mass, length, you name it, all coming from the global take. One of the reasons for handing over the Nobel Prize to the laureates Anton Seilinger, Alan Specht, and Klauser. In the year 2022, on the 10th of December that year, they received the Nobel Prize for proving that local reality, a separable tiny part of the universe, <laughs> does not work as reality. Reality is the totality of all relations in all of the universe. So, this is where I left off and I will continue to read. On the other hand, the adherence to a metaphysics of relations does not have any means at her disposal to rule out that there are some intrinsic properties or other of the 
related things. On an a priori basis, her claim can only be that since her position is coherent, there's no argument left for maintaining that related things must of metaphysical necessity have some intrinsic property or other. Her a priori argument can only be that applying Occam's razor. <laughs> oh, sharp, watch out. It is superfluous to include unknowable intrinsic properties in our account of the basic level of the world. However, in order to make a positive case for a metaphysics of relations, 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 Mere coherence is not enough. However, in order to make a positive case for a metaphysics of relations, mere coherence is not enough. Not enough. Not enough. <laughs> Not enough at all, at all, at all. <laughs> Great, baby. You sounded like a BBC announcer there. <laughs> <laughs> you have a good voice. <laughs> <laughs> It is here that the metaphysical importance of the philosophy of quantum physics shows up. Shows up. Shows up, shows up, shows up. If we interpret quantum entanglement in terms of non-separability, As sketched in this paper, we are entitled to maintain that the specific relations which are basic physical theory treats do not call for intrinsic properties of the related systems being admitted in our metaphysics even if we cannot know these properties in so far as they are intrinsic they are intrinsic they are intrinsic Indeed. <laughs> Thus, contrary, and this is important, to the received opinion. Quantum physics, in virtue of exhibiting entanglement, 
just provides us with the means to avoid a gap between epistemology and metaphysics. We can, in principle, know all there is at the basic level of the world. For what there is at the basic level of the world are the relations of quantum entanglement. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so here we see that at the bottom, and we know that for a fact, do you know the difference to the received opinion? So aptly put by Michael Esfeld. In contrast to the received understanding, we do not rely, as you can say, we do not rely on separable properties to understand reality. And that goes both, both for science and human understanding. And this is something in this series we often taken up. This also coming now from neurology. 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 That reality, as we perceive it, is not in separable parts. It is not like first we see some photons that goes into the eye and we analyze them and blend them in magical portions to make up a flower or a mountain in the distance or something similar. No, reality comes as effects of entanglement. The totality. I think it has earlier been referred to as a panoramic view. Panoramic view is taking in everything. Although it seems to be referring mostly to vision, do not be fooled, it goes for the totality of the experience. The perceptual gestalt, if you like. Michael Esfeld earlier mentioned that relational quantum mechanics or the model that he put forward is a sort of quantum holism. It's the totality of everything that is perception, attention, reality. So this is why I feel apt to add the second chapter of Ian McGillchrist's The Matter with Things. I think it wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that that is his magnum opus. The sheer size of it <laughs> is is <laughs> more than telling for how much work has been put into it. And I will read from chapter two called Attention. Attention. Start with some sights here. Our world 
is not simply the way we look at the world. Worldviews create worlds. The question is not what you look at, but what you see. Henry Thoreau. As a man is, so he sees, wrote William Blake. Who we are then determines how we see. And how we see determines what we find. What we find! Given that the hemispheres see differently, how reliable is each hemisphere in its disclosing of the world? Disclosing of the world. <laughs> disclosing of the world. The disclosing of the world. What elements does each contribute to reality? One way to get a handle on this is to take a look at what happens when there is a degree of impairment in the functioning of one hemisphere at a time. At a time. Either through illness, accident, or temporary experimental inactivation. 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 Damage to which hemisphere has the more catastrophic effect on our experience of the world? In part one, I will deal with hemisphere differences in relation to what one might call the portals of access. Ways in which we get a handle on reality and in this chapter I will examine the all important role of attention Attention is not just another cognitive function.
Attention is how our world comes into being for us. The altered nature of attention can appear to abolish parts of the world, collapse time and space, eviscerate emotion, and render the living inan inanimate. It is a profoundly moral act. Though attention and perception are importantly <laughs> different, there's bound to be some overlap since abnormal attention leads to abnormal perceptions and vice versa. And vice versa. That's <laughs> a great point. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> In turn, perceptions inevitably involve making judgments. So this and the two succeeding chapters on perception and judgment should be seen not as entirely separate, but as one continuous process of helping the reader appreciate the extent and importance of hemisphere differences as they unfold before our eyes. Before our eyes. Before our eyes. Yeah. Before That's our right. eyes. <laughs> It is fair to say that though the main deficits incurred by damage to the left hemisphere are in the twin important areas of the use of language and of the right hand the world itself usually remains recognizable and mainly, though not always wholly undisturbed. That is because the right hemisphere is functioning as normal, as normal, as normal, as normal, 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 as normal, as normal, as normal can be.
As normal as normal can be. What is normal? What is normal? What is normal? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Things are very different when the damage is in the right hemisphere. Damage in the right hemisphere. Indeed. The subject is more or wholly dependent on the left. On the left. When those who care for the left hemisphere stroke patients were asked to specify the most important problem encountered. They named difficulty writing or spelling. By contrast, when those who care for right hemisphere stroke patients were asked, it was the loss of empathy. The loss of empathy. It's not terrible. Almost half of the carers for those with right hemisphere stroke reported as among the most important problems a whole range of cognitive and emotional impairments, as well as alterations to personality. Not one of the carers for left hemisphere stroke sufferers did so. For those with right hemisphere damage, they and their world had change. For those with left hemisphere damage, they and their world were recognizably the same. It, it was their ability to handle it, to make use of it, that had altered. The mechanistic aspect. As we have seen, the foundational difference between the hemispheres lies in the way they attend and how you attend changes the world. So attention, attention is everything. Attention is everything, attention is everything. <laughs> Since it is of such consummate importance, let us take a closer look at attention.
from a hemisphere point of view. The first thing to make clear is that there is a very substantial body of research over several decades indicating that the right hemisphere has by far the greater control of attention in general. as well as for switching attention. It is a familiar fact that in right-handers, speech lateralizes to the left hemisphere in almost all cases. What is not so well known, so well appreciated, is that attentional dominance lateralizes even more strongly to the right hemisphere than speech does to the left. And left-handers still display right hemispheric attentional dominance in 81% of cases. And in parenthesis, we read a greater proportion than those still showing left hemispheric language dominance. And here I will put a, a pause. Let's see here. 2075. Oh my God, I have almost a hundred videos to put on YouTube. <laughs> what to work. Hans Multi Production. <laughs> <laughs> Not without quality, though. <laughs> oh, thank you. It's way too kind. <laughs> so, this is a the viewpoint already here. It's recognizable from the one coming from Ludwig Wittgenstein. And he says similar things. The way the world is, is how you attend to it. And for him, language is a specific way of attending in different persons. We have an attitude to the world. And I think, especially in philosophical investigations, he wants to 
help us discover that attitude of us, our intention, because it's constantly present. But it seems sometimes that we forget about it. Is this forgetfulness that he strives to reveal and see it's all forgotten. Actually, in that aspect, it's similar to Martin Heidegger, who also speaks of some sort of forgetfulness. I especially write this on the second page here. The, the third line, the altered nature of attention can appear to abolish parts of the world, collapse time and space, eviscerate emotion, and render the living inanimate. Inanimate. It is a profoundly moral act. So morality comes in here. And of course, to see something, <laughs> it's quite obvious, to render something living inanimate, to dissolve something, is, of course, a profoundly moral act. And since we live in the age, as we mentioned before, we live now in the age of left, Hemispheric dominance. We need to rediscover that we made a choice, that our attention can be different. And how important that option to see that we have an option, to regain our free will, so to speak, or regain our will even further to say, in this way, we can regain our humanity. Otherwise, we become soulless. And our language won't even mean anything anymore if we do not enter into reality. Remember Severin Schroeder and Paul Johnston? Paul Livingston, Francis Wallin, the authors that show that without a criterion, without a doing, without a stage setting, language do not have a substance anymore. What will it turn into? It would turn into a desold language. It will lack a chi, if you like, the Chinese word for spirit or energy or live liveliness. And that's very clear at the very end of what I read. For those with right hemisphere damage, they and their world had change, changed. For those with left hemisphere damage, they and their world were recognizably the same. It was their ability to handle it, to make use of it that had altered. So the mechanistic principles disappeared or become uh, quite differently. My take on that, in these day and age, we judge what we do with much less care. This is something I discovered in painting. 
we become much coarser, brute, not as fine-tuned anymore. We no longer have this delicate hands or delicate writing. <laughs> we are degenerating into chat GTB. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's a bit exaggerated, but <laughs> something. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Something <laughs> in that region. <laughs> I better stop before I make a fool out of myself. Miria, please come in and save save me. <laughs> what do you say? Uh, Are you there? Yes, I'm there. Would you like to comment on something? Or do you want to wait till next time? Or what do you say? I'm going through my notes actually, but uh, ah, very kind. Are you making yeah. notes? Yeah, four pages. Are you kidding? Yes. <laughs> I'm so honored, Miria. I have no idea. My God. Oh. Can you actually explain a little bit? because it wasn't clear to me understanding it. Uh, when you talked about uh, the reality that comes as an effect of an entanglement and then having the panoramic view, the panoramic vision, um, the totality of this experience is seen as a quantum polism. Uh, can you actually explain a little bit on the quantum polism? Yeah, sure. Uh, let's see what end I should start with. Uh, we used to think that reality was local, that you could isolate to understand. I think that has been the, uh, the way of doing things until recently in all subjects bar physics. So it's only in quantum mechanics we've been looking at the world through the lens of the totality of everything. And of course, that rea rea to realize take took to realize that took experimentation. It cannot be thought out. <clears throat> and that happened in the 1920s, the 1930s. Later proved by other quantum mechanic, mechanics, mechanics, or quantum physicists like Salinger and Aspect, and of course, good old John Bell. So we discovered, so to speak, despite the received understanding of reality, that reality is actually a whole thing And when I say panoramic vision, that means that we today usually focus our eyes in one direction only, quite literally. But a panoramic vision means that you take in everything, not only what's in front of you or the, where the attention is for the moment, what sort of fixates you. And Oh, your question is very apt for to understand what I said. Uh, more of Ian McKilchrist is needed, but 
One thing he you says. You mean further study, further study beyond. Yeah, the, yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, what we talk thing, today. Exactly. One thing he says is that the left hemisphere is, or it's, this is a tricky word. He says the left hemisphere is sticky, almost like chewing gum <laughs> Boy. or glue. So its attention is to one thing only. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, for a couple of years ago, it became a fashion trend here in Sweden that everyone should wear white shoes, like really white. And many people got fixated on looking in the direction of the whiteness because it's so unusual in clothing and especially in nature and in architecture as well. It's called True. optic white, optic white. So I think that's an effect of the sticky brain or the sticky attention. You focus too much on one point, you don't see the whole outfit, one detail, and it tends to draw in the attention involuntarily at, in the person. So the person who has, as we all do, I think, uh, a left hemispheric dominance normally get this separable attention. This, mm -hmm. now I'm going out on a limb here, it's getting further, this laboratory-like attention slash way of understanding the world. The idea that you can understand the world by separating the, them into atoms, <laughs> different subjects, Look at the university, how many subjects do we have nowadays? 200? We separate everything and then we want to put it together to make a whole. This is the left hemispheric outtake, but in contrast to that, you have the right hemisphere and the panoramic view and quantum holism. That starts with a whole and actually says, as I said earlier uh, in my class fields, when I read my class field, even the property of being completely individual, a private <laughs> individual, <laughs> individuality, in individuality, so to say, actually provenly comes from the whole. Yes. And of course, this is a difficult segue going from Asphil to Ian McKilchrist. Uh, did it make it a bit more clear or is it equally blurry? Yeah, I think that this uh, term, like uh, the coin term quantum holism, could uh, be the one connecting the both. Ah, yeah, 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 definitely. And this, of course, takes a getting, some getting used to. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned this before, listeners and dear Miria. Yes. Uh, when the Nobel Prize was given to the Mr. Aspect, Seilinger and Klauser, the formulation yes. was actually wrong. The formulation coming from the professors of Kungliga Tekniska Högskolan, KTH in, in Stockholm. Was actually wrong. They Can wrote, you, they yeah. wrote that the mistress, uh, the scientists proved that, that, there is, <clears throat> that there is no reality. <laughs> <laughs> this is not what uh, relational quantum mechanics is saying. Although, since and I can understand the mistake, although it was quite embarrassing, of course, because it had to be changed. I can understand the mistake. Everything we do, actually do it the received way, the acknowledged way, by separating everything. That even goes for making a cake. Recipes today are actually separable. Two... To a certain extent, for a good thing, 
there are I met chefs who says it's not a good thing. Mm -hmm. That is a totality. Uh, I have friends who are professors in neurology. They say a human, you can understand it by cutting it up. Brain there, muscle there, <laughs> fascia over there. <laughs> 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 and then, lo and behold, listeners and Miriam, they put yes. it together to try to make a Frankenstein's monster. <laughs> 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 Something we mentioned before, how science put even human beings into to a new format. A new but isn't, isn't that some form of reductionism? Oh, yeah. Most definitely. You got it now. You got it now, Miriam. Yes. Exactly. I'd say it makes reductionism inevitable because we don't have a choice. There is nothing else to do. We can only reduce things to the smallest entities until quantum mechanics came and it's still coming on. But also in the natural world, oh, yeah. uh, if we take a look at uh, orga anything organic uh, that is unified in a whole has a value. And, and when you are, you cannot reduce it to the sum of the individual parts, not no, even no, no. And for, furthermore, even more with humans. Yeah, exactly. You got it now. Not all bad, since it was very hard to, to understand from that short mentioning <laughs> we need a quantum enlightenment yeah. enlightenment because we actually had a mechanistic enlightenment before yeah but now we need it on the quantum level exactly you got it <laughs> <laughs> with that incredibly happy note i think uh, we should round up what do you say Miriam? yes thank you for today's lecture well, thank you very much for your comments and questions. Uh, thank you everyone for listening in. Have a beautiful morning, day or afternoon, wherever you are. Bye-bye for now. The same. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.